Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this edition of our Intro to Confluence webinar. My name is Steve Terelmus. I am a managing consultant here at Expium, and I will tell you a little bit more about Expium a little later on in this webinar. But if you're coming to this webinar, you're probably interested in Atlassian's Confluence tool. So we are going to take some time today and talk about the Confluence tool. Now, I really don't have a lot of slides today. I'm actually going to be basically showing you the tool itself throughout the whole webinar. Um, and I do hope that this is a good use of your time. But I want to make sure that you are uh, aware of who I am and how you can get a hold of me if you have any questions on Confluence or on anything related to Atlassian. Um, I work with Expium and we help customers with any and all things related to Atlassian, um, whether it's the product or the platform. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, contact me and I can, uh, I can help you out. Okay, I wanna talk, basically I'm gonna jump right in to the tool because what we're gonna do for the next hour is we are gonna drive through this tool as, as a kind of a high level overview of all of the um, features and capabilities that it has, as well as talk a lot about the importance of approaching Confluence from a strategic standpoint. So Confluence is, is a tool that needs to be handled like most tools, right, with respect. So if you don't, you may have a mess on your hands. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about a little as well. So let me jump right in. Um, basically, when I talk about Confluence uh, being a tool uh, to use, uh, what, what we really want to talk about is the idea of how do we strategically manage Confluence? Uh, oftentimes when we work with clients, one of the biggest problems we see is that they're using Confluence and they understand the basic functionality of how to use Confluence. They've just kind of made a bit of a mess of their system uh, because they never really started off on the right foot uh, from the perspective of, um, of setting up Confluence in a strategic way. So I want to kind of touch base on a couple of ideas here. This is the first idea. Um, Confluence was brought about by Atlassian as an opportunity to consolidate information, knowledge sharing, and things like that. And uh, this, is a, this is a diagram that we've uh, stolen from Atlassian. And it basically illustrates the idea of how before Confluence, you had a lot of different people and you had a lot of different places of information. Like you might have a lot of emails flying around and those emails might have been forwarded and replied to 20 or 30 times. You might have had some documents or some other artifacts and there really wasn't a single place or if there was a single place, it was something like Microsoft, um, uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Explorer, like Microsoft Word or Excel or or SharePoint, or even the G Suite with GDocs or things like that, right? And so everybody's organizational structure started from the perspective of a person, and then that person had a series of folders. And so that was the extent of the organization. And so it was very chaotic. You didn't know when there was a document, who actually owned the document, uh, or where the document lived. There sometimes would be share drives, but then the visualization of that information was often hard to find apart from just how good the search function was in that tool. What Confluence does is Confluence comes in and stands between all of these uh, points of information and all of the people that need the information. And it does two things primarily. It allows the people to impact the information either by creating information or viewing information, but it also brings to the people information and it brings it to lights. For example, if a user is looking at a particular subject, if Confluence is structured and organized correctly, the user will immediately notice that there are a number of other documents out there on the same subject that they may not have even have been aware existed. And that's really the value of Confluence. If Confluence is being used correctly, it will bring to light to the people what's out there that is going to support them uh, across the board. This also identifies help identifies gap analysis as well, right? So if we are looking at a subject matter and we see the information that we've written on it and we see all the other information that other people in our organization have written on it, we can easily also see what's missing and what needs to be updated. The other key point with, with Confluence is not just individual people finding information, it's also the idea of the entire organization agreeing on how information should be organized. That's a really 
key concept with Confluence that a lot of people don't think about. And unfortunately, they even don't think about it until after they've built out Confluence, which results in a tool that is a very powerful tool not quite being used correctly because it's been built out in a disorganized way. So when we talk to folks about Confluence, we want them to understand it's not only this idea of bringing information together in the right way. It's also the idea of strategically organizing that information across the entire organization. So we call Confluence not just a document tool, but a content portal. And that difference is really stark. A documentation tool is just a place where you go out and write information and then bury it somewhere in a folder. A content portal is a place that is going to help you find information quickly. It's going to be a place that's going to reveal to you information that you didn't know existed. It's going to be a place where your entire organization is going to agree upon how different things, are, where different things live and how they are organized. That is a successful Confluent uh, content portal. And that is what Confluent sets out to do. And if you set it up correctly, then, uh, then it can do that. It can be very powerful. Now, we touch on these strategic high-level ideas in the beginning of this webinar because it's important for folks to understand that. We don't understand your documentation process or the, the, the amount of documents that you have or what they say or what they are, right? As, as, as a consultant, I don't understand that. I can only kind of set you on the right path as far as helping you understand the concept of organization. So hopefully the webinar today will give you some tools that will help you to get to the point, drive your Confluence instance to the point where you are actually organizing it in a strategic way. And if you're new to Confluence, hopefully this gives you the incentive to actually start off on the right foot by organizing Confluence correctly. Okay, so I'm going to take another quick slide over here and talk about really high level, what does that mean by organizing things correctly? When we jump into the tool, I'm going to show you what this exactly looks like in the tool. But when we think about Confluence, at a high level, Confluence is a bucket of, inf of, of, of collections of information. Uh, Lassian calls those buckets in Confluence spaces. Uh, a space is going to be a home for pages. And of course, the information you're looking for are on those pages. Uh, what's going to be obvious when I get into the demo is that that page is not just words. It's not just content. That page is the very portal that we're, th that we're talking about. So it might be words, information. It might also be pictures. It might also be links or attachments. It might also be uh, direct connects to other pieces of information that are not stored on Confluence. So when we look at spaces, a lot of times we don't just define spaces as collections of content. We define spaces either as content spaces or view spaces, right? Because a, an entire space in Confluence could have absolutely no content on it whatsoever. It's just a space that's designed to organize information that you need to get to. And I'll give you some examples of that when we actually get in the tool. But this really crude bubble diagram is a great starting point for conversation. If you are working through organizing Confluence in a strategic way or even building up Confluence, looking at this uh, document right here and sitting down with teams in your company and walking through a document like this is really invaluable. And what it's intended to point out is how are we organizing our information across the organization? Information always lands in some place. And if we don't sit down holistically and organize that, it can land in a lot of different places that make it really hard to find down the road. For example, um, there's some spaces on this diagram that are intended to be what I call micro spaces, small spaces, small collections of information that are relevant only to small groups of people or even just one person individually. At the same time, there's spaces on this diagram that what I call macro spaces. These are spaces that are open to a broad number of people, maybe even everybody in your organization, maybe even more people that are even in Confluence or other Atlassian tools, right? You might have a very large organization and you may open up a space to the entire organization just to bring about this idea of consolidated uh, uh, information management. Now, we even have some people that use Confluence as a tool for like an intranet portal to help employees with onboarding or to tell employees what's for, what's for lunch in the lunchroom that day, 
that kind of thing, right? Confluence can be that broad if you want it to be. Here's a couple of examples. Um, in Confluence, you set up spaces and the documents live in those spaces. So for instance, every user in Confluence has a right to set up their own personal space. This is kind of like their own little area where they can build out conf uh, document, documents that may not be ready to be put into other places yet, or may just be personal notes they're taking on things. Personal spaces are also a great place uh, to have like a little mini sandbox where a user can actually play around with Confluence and learn things like learning how to do different macros and things like that. Uh, many times the information that's collected in personal spaces will eventually be valuable to more than one person. And therefore a document that lives on a per personal space may at some point in the future be copied or moved to some other space. Um, oftentimes I encourage people when they are drafting documents uh, to start on their personal space so they don't clutter up other spaces. Then as they get the document to a point where it's maybe ready to be reviewed, share that document with a few people for editing. And then sometime between that editing process and the publishing process, it gets moved out of the personal space into some other space that's more broadly relevant for that type of document, like a policy or a how-to document or something like that. Another space is governance space. Now, governance space would be almost the opposite of a personal space. A governance space would be a very broad space. This is a space that everybody in Confluence should see, and maybe even everybody across your organization. Governance is going to be a broad place for knowledge sharing, information, policies, structures around how you are governing certain things. For example, Atlassian tools. If you have a collection of Atlassian tools that you're using, you should have a governance space for Atlassian tools. The governance space for Atlassian tools is going to show you who the governing bodies are, who are making decisions on the Atlassian tools, and how do you get involved in those governing bodies? It's gonna have information on activities that are happening. Like you might have a governance project in JIRA where people submit tickets to do things like buy a new add-on or change a governing policy or something like that. Those tickets can be represented in dashboards on the governance site so everybody in the organization can see what issues are tracking and how they are moving forward. Another example of a governance space might be your how-to articles or your policies. If you want to start up a project in JIRA, what is the policy for doing that? What is the process? There's going to be maybe a template there that asks you what kind of fields and what kind of issue types and what kind of workflows you want. Maybe you need to put that template together first and submit it. So that information on how to manage things from a policy standpoint or a how-to standpoint is, again, a great thing to put in your governance space. That's going to be spread out across the entire organization. If somebody, somebody may not even be involved in Atlassian tools, but by having an open governance space, they can look at things like maybe demos or things like that and actually see whether or not their group is good for uh, JIRA or something like that. And of course, the more people that get involved in Atlassian, the more collaborative your work can be across your entire organization. So governance, a very, very big space that's really all open and uh, very visible with lots of information in it. Um, again, you can kind of see from this, as something were to grow in value from a documentation standpoint, a how-to article, maybe a user creates, has a new add-on, and they learn something about the add-on. Well, there should probably be a how-to article on that add-on in the governance space, and then that user can then update that how-to article or draft that how-to article, something like that. Okay, uh, a, a department. So some of our companies are large. Uh, and some of them are small, but we all have valuable things that we bring to the marketplace as a company. What are those things? And what defines their value? All of that information is very broad information. And sometimes it's departmentalized. Um, I think about, I used to work in the energy industry. So a great example of this is the different things that energy companies bring to bear on the market. Uh, some might be generation, right? They generate electricity. Other things might be transportation, which is the distribution of that en energy from the generating plants to people who need it. Other things might be metering. How much energy is somebody using, right? These are all macro concepts that an energy company is going to do you might want to have a departmental space for each one of those so that people across the organization can better understand and learn what other departments and divisions are doing in their organization. Maybe they can bring to bear some skill sets into those departments just by learning a little bit more about them. Also, you can make a departmental space public, which means that people outside your organization can see it. When we get into the demo, I'm going to actually show you several public confluence spaces, and you're going to be amazed to see how people are actually using Confluence 
for public activity and helping people out publicly either understand about their company or process something as a customer. So those are department spaces. They can be very public. They can also be contained within the organization as well. And then you might have a bevy of spaces that are really around what I like to call the real work that's going on, right? Whether that work is uh, is actual work, uh, like we're building something or we're, or we're developing something or whatever, or it might be what I call strategic work. In other words, we're figuring out what our budgets are going to be for next year. And we're going to figure out what some of our macro projects are for next year, or maybe what some of our portfolio epics are going to be and how those are going to tie into our budget, right? This is all work we do as an organization. Those concepts should be buried or uh, should be put into a, um, a, a space as well. And how you break up those spaces is really going to depend on your organization and how your organization works. You might have project spaces that are separate from team spaces, or you might just have team spaces with individual projects buried inside of them. However you do that is really going to be up to you and kind of goes down to the finer details of how confluence should be managed. But the key point is that you want a very broad agreement on this, right? You don't want some people that are building project spaces and other people that are building team spaces when really there should be one central way of doing that. So it's really important as you evolve and build out and start with Confluence that you have these big conversations. How do we organize data in our company, information in our company? What is the best way to do that? So when people are looking for things, it's very easy for them to find it. And it's also easy for us to help bring to light key information. The more you can expand knowledge across your organization at a macro level, the more powerful, of course, your organization is. Okay, so those are some really high level concepts around Confluence strategically. Let's jump back into the tool. Notice, by the way, I'm actually using the tool Confluence for this entire uh, webinar here. Okay, so I'm going to jump right back into the Confluence tool and I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm going to just run through in the next, you know, 40, 45 minutes, I'm just going to run through what the tool does. And as I do it, I'm going to just kind of periodically throw out various strategic things that we've learned in our journeys. So Confluence does uh, really about four or five main things. One, it can be a documentation tool. Uh, two, it can also be a tool to link information in from other places in Confluence or other uh, places that exist out there on the web or in your internal uh, uh, documentation avenues or whatever. Uh, and, and then three, it, it is a place where you can use particular confluence tools to actually draw to light information that might be hidden otherwise. And then four, it can be a place to standardize things like forms and templates and things like that. So we're going to really quickly go through and just show you guys all of those. Um, as we go through, I do want to point out that if you guys are looking for help with Confluence, this is exactly what we do. And I'm actually going to take this second to quick jump back over to my presentation and tell you a little bit about who XBM is and how we relate to Atlassian. So Atlassian, as you know, has been around for many years. There's about 150,000, maybe 200,000 at this point, companies that use Atlassian tools all over the globe. Uh, but Atlassian makes really good products, but they actually lean very heavily on their partner network for other activities like making sure their customers are doing well. And so there's a very broad and strong partner network and ecosystem in Atlassian of about 500 partners. There's varying levels of partners. Uh, platinum is the highest. There's about 20 platinum partners in the US of which XBM is one. So as a platinum solutions partner, we can meet any and all of your Atlassian needs from uh, training, which is one of our uh, big things that we do, bread and butter. Our training is comprised of webinars like this, which are free. We also do paid classes. Our paid uh, One of the benchmarks of our paid classes is that we do hands-on workshops. So if you came to one of our paid classes, you would actually be in a tool. Like we have a full day Confluence bootcamp. You would be in the Confluence tool. Everything I'm showing you today, you would actually be doing, building out and working on so that when you leave the class, you actually have built things in the tool. That's one of the benchmarks of our training is hands on workshop based training. Also, we do consulting and our consulting ranges from everything you need. Um, best practices, high level strategic consulting, all the way down to trying to help you guys fix something that may be wrong with your system. I, for some reason, I've got a ton of issues that are hanging out on my board and I can't get rid of them. Well, did you set your resolution? No, I didn't. Okay, let's show you how to set your resolution. Okay, now it's fixed. Everything in between those two 
those two broad spectrums. Also, we provide consulting at a vertical level. Like we will consult people on individual projects and help them build out individual projects. We will also help consult you on scaled, um, uh, scaled enterprise strategies as well. How do I bring uh, a tool like Jira and Confluence uh, up into my organization and connect it with things like lean budgeting and stuff like that? So our Confluence is very, our, our consulting is very broad. Uh, custom development. So we will actually help people with custom solutions, whether they're in tool custom solutions like advanced workflows or scripting within a tool like Jira, or actually outside of the tool custom solutions, um, like building a skin that sits on top of Jira or building some sort of um, uh, web page interface that helps you manage your Atlassian tools. Uh, we also have a sister company that works right alongside of us. Uh, their name is Oasis Digital and they do all front end development work. So uh, we can do complete customized solutions and we can do full stack support in that. And then finally, licensing. If you have licensing needs, working with a partner is helpful for two reasons. One, we can help you understand your best licensing solution. What funds do you need? Uh, when you're ready to migrate to the cloud, what's the best tier to migrate to for your for your needs? Uh, how do you want to grow and things like that? What's the best way to grow? Uh, we can help you out with a lot of that with licensing. And then number two, once you license with us, you have a direct relationship with Expium. Um, we don't really, I mean, we're not going to give you intense consulting as a result of that, but it is, we are a phone call away, which is probably going to be something more than you're going to get with Atlassian if you license directly with them. So if you have any questions on any of these four things, don't hesitate to reach out to me after the webinar. We can help you with that. A lot of people are moving to the cloud. Um, and we actually have a webinar on cloud migration that we've done already. We're going to be doing another one coming up soon in 2021. Licensing is a big deal when you're moving to the cloud. So if you're thinking about moving to the cloud, please reach out to us first before you procure licenses. Um, I guarantee it'll be well worth your while to do it. Okay. That is who we are. Now I'm going to start walking through high level um, the, uh, the aspects that are really comprised in Confluence. And if any of this interests you, again, on a monthly basis, we do have a Confluence bootcamp class that takes us into a full day class, hands-on workshop-based class. Okay. Um, basically, some of the simple things with Confluence is it is a content tool, right? It is a page editor if you want to. This is a sample page. I actually grab this information from this guy at Atlassian who wrote a article on the iron triangle of planning using uh, uh, using agile and I'm going to use this page as an a as an example of some of the basic editing things that you can do in confluence okay first of all when you're viewing a page every confluence page has a like button on it and it has a comment section on the bottom this is tremendously valuable in saving a huge amount of email if you guys are working on a page in confluence instead of emailing back and forth saying hey go check out my edits or what do you think of this or can you go and review this and 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 tell me what you think you can just put a comment right down here and at mention somebody you can say hey um so and so uh can you come and check my um my com my, my comments or my document or whatever and that will send that person a direct email or it will send them a notification in their Atlassian tools however or in slack however you guys are using notification and they can come in here and and they can um they can review your document. Also notice this comment section is actually a full script editor. There's all kinds of things you can do in here, include adding images or links or tables or all kinds of things. So there's lots of stuff that you can do in comment sections. This concept of having a running comment section for each page that exists in Confluence already, in my opinion, puts Confluence ahead of other tools that are out there in the marketplace, even for just you know, editing features. Okay. Also, when you highlight a confluence uh, element, you can go there and you can actually create a Jira ticket directly off of that, or you can create an inline comment like you can with other editing tools, right? So those are two really nice features. I'm going to show you later on in the webinar, some of the nice features around Jira issue and Jira connection and collaboration between Jira and confluence. But any, any piece of information on a confluence page can be used to automatically create a Jira ticket. You can save things for later and then you can watch things. This is a nice uh, feature in Confluence that allows you to get uh, notifications when things get changed on a document you're watching. So this is my document. I'm going to send this out to my team to review and edit, and then I'm going to watch it. As soon as a team member comes in there and makes a change, I'm going to get a notification saying that, hey, Bob just changed your document through my notification channels. 
Uh, of course, you can share it as well. Up here, I want to show you a few things. These are your breadcrumbs that track back this document into its main space. So I'm going all the way back into, uh, as you build out a hierarchy of pages, you'll always have that hierarchy right here at the top. And then you also have restrictions where you can hide a page from being seen from certain people or certain groups if you want to protect it. Over here, you have a number of other options you can do like attachments. I'll talk about that a little bit later. You can see some page histories. You can see your restrictions, people who have viewed it. You can export it out to PDF or Word or other things, and you can copy or move this page, which is really useful when you're building a page from scratch. Maybe you have it on your personal space, and then you're ready to move it over to a, a broader corporate space or something like that. So lots of things that you can do right here as you're reviewing this document. Now, if you're ready to edit the document, you just click that edit document button right there and it takes you into the editor. The editor is like most document editors. It's going to give you different font sizes, bold, italics, underline. It's also going to give you bullet points. It's going to give you numbering. Uh, Confluence also has this really neat, neat feature that's called a task feature. And I'll show you real quick how that works because I really like that. Um, it's almost like a bulleted feature. And what happens is when you create a task feature, Confluence automatically recognizes that you are identifying a task for this document. So please, you could put a task right at the top, top of the document. Please review this uh, document, right? And there's a task. And so Confluence is gonna identify that like a bulleted list but what they're doing in the background is they're grabbing that as a task and you can actually run task reports. If I go under my profile right here, I have a task report that I can run that identifies what tasks have I created, what tasks are, are out there waiting for me to act on something and things like that. Uh, so that's a really nice feature. You can also take those tasks and add things in it like dates. Um, please review this document by tomorrow. Or you can actually go in and you can add a specific call out. Please uh, review at... Uh, you know, Steve Terrellness. And then, you know, that will actually ping Steve and say, hey, you just got mentioned in a task. And so there's a lot of great things you can do in the editor around tasks. Moving over, uh, of course, you have the indent, outdent, and the justification items like you always have. This is a page layout. If I click on this, um, it's actually going to give me the opportunity to section my page out. Right now, it's just in one section, but I can break it up into column sections or multiple columns, and I can add additional sections throughout the document. So for instance, if I wanted my tasks to be in a section, I could add a section right here, and then I can move that section up. And I can put all my tasks just right there in that, put, put that all right there in the section at the top if I wanted. So a lot of different things you can do there with sectioning as well. Um, I am actually, just so you know, I'm showing you the on-prem version of Confluence. There is a cloud version of Confluence that has all of the same features, but sometimes they appear a little bit differently on the cloud version. When you come to our Confluence class, we teach it from both perspectives. So if you are, are not quite familiar with the layout of the screen because yours looks a little different, don't worry. You're probably just looking at the difference between cloud versus on-prem. Uh, other editing features are features like inserting files and attachments. Uh, you can insert a file directly into a page if you want to. For instance, as you look down here, this was just a copy paste of, a, of an image right into this document. Um, so there's lots of options there. Um, you can also add links, and I'll talk about linking in a little bit. You can also add a table if you want to. Let me get rid of these tasks in this section here because I want to come on and get rid of that. Um, I want to drop a table right in there. So I can just drop a table right here. And then this is just an automatic justified table that I can just start putting text into and I can do whatever I want in that table. So it's just basic editing functions that you find in most things. Now there's a drop down box here that gives you a bunch of other things like uh, you can do markups, you can do like a, a line across it. There's another task thing date. You can add emoticons, symbols, you can add other things as well. And this goes on and on. You can also connect to like Miro, uh, which is like a, uh, a scrap boarding type uh, tool. Um, you can add other things. A lot of these additional things you start adding in are things called macros, and I'm going to get into that at the end. Okay, so real high level overview of how to draft on a tool. I'm going to save that guy and go back to my main page and move on to the next few things. Okay, linking and attachments. Linking and attachments is one of the most powerful things in Confluence. It gives you the ability to really turn Confluence from a documentation tool into a content portal, a, a true content portal. And the types of things that are available to you in linking are varied. For example, 
Uh, Confluence can represent links from any destination based on permissions. This is a really nice feature. If you are bringing things in, uh, Confluence will respect those permissions. For instance, if you're linking SharePoint in, uh, when a user clicks on that link in Confluence, it's not going to bring them a, a SharePoint document. It's going to take them to the SharePoint document, which means that all your SharePoint permissions are going to apply. Same thing within the tool. If you link a page in Confluence to another page in Confluence and a user clicks on that link, if they don't have permission to see it, they're not going to be able to see it. So you can do a sample. Uh, so this is just a link from a Confluence page within this instance. And the name of the page is sample edit page. And if I click on this and open it up as a new page, there it is. This is my sample edit page. This is actually the page I was just showing you guys a few minutes ago. Um, this is a link from a Confluence page in, in a completely different instance. So I can actually link in Confluence across instances. And I have this in two forms. I have it as the URL form and I have it as a labeled form. So if I just click on this, that's gonna take me to a, um, uh, this is a page that's called Google Widget, and it's a bunch of information on Google Widgets, and I'm actually going to share this with you guys later on, but this is actually taking me to a completely different instance. So I can, I can link to other Confluence instances if I want. These are public URLs, and again, I can lay out a normal link or just I can have a direct label link there, and I click on that, and that's actually going to take me into Atlassian's website to that article that I was just sharing with you about the Agile Triangle. And there's lots of other linking you can do. I'm going to get into that a little bit more later, especially when it comes to things like linking to other documentation tools like G Suite and stuff like that. Also, you have attachments. So attachments live on pages in Confluence. So if I click over here on my ellipses on the right-hand side, I'm going to see my attachments. Here are all the attachments that are on this page. These actually, actually happen to be attachments of Marvel characters and DC characters. If I want to view those, I can just um, take a look at that. Let me see if this works here. There we go. There's, there's uh, you know, Doctor Strange and there's Batman and there's uh, Superman, Wonder Woman, et cetera, et cetera. I can scroll through those. Uh, versioning works in attachments. So if I have an attachment and I bring another attachment, uh, a newer version of the attachment, dump it in there, it will show up as separate versioning. You can label attachments, which is really powerful because again, looking to Confluence as a content portal, you can go to another space and you can draw into that space attachments based on their labels. Uh, so really nice feature with that there. Um, also, uh, when I talk about attachments, I'd like to give you a little strategic uh, note on that. Um, when you talk about attachments, you're getting into the concept of the version of truth. And one of the things that's really important with Confluence, as with many other things when you're talking about information, is what is your version of truth? Right now, as an attachment, my version of truth is the attachment, which means that if this is an Excel document and I go over to my uh, wherever in the world that Excel document lives and I update it, it's not going to update on here unless I actually bring in a macro to connect that Excel document directly into here. And the reason why is because the Confluence is not the version of truth. The Excel file is the version of truth. If you want Confluence to be the version of truth, then you have to directly connect that Excel document into Confluence or actually use a spreadsheet in Confluence or something like that. So that concept of version of truth is a very important strategic idea to keep in mind. Now, the nice thing about attachments is they live on a page, but if you want to, you can call that attachment to view directly on the page. This, what you're looking at right here, is not my attachments. This is what's called a macro. If I click on my edit, you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about. This is actually a macro that says, go out and bring to light all of the attachments on this page. Now, what's interesting about that is that it not only visualizes the attachments so that they're not just hidden behind the scenes, it also gives you the ability to visualize that tool for attachments on any page. Again, Confluence being a, a content portal. If I can pull all of the attachments on this page and show them on the page, then I can do it with any other page in Confluence as well. And all I need to do is duplicate this attachment macro and then go into the macro instead of saying, show me the, um, show me the, uh, the attachments on this page, I can actually just put in a different page. I think it's down here, page title. I can just add a different page and it will show me the attachments on that other page. And so I could actually have one 
page in Confluence, and I could even put it on my personal space because it's of interest to me, right? And on that page, I have attachment macro after attachment macro, and each attachment macro is bringing to light all the attachments of various pages across Confluence that I'm interested in a great and powerful tool for content portal management. But also when I have this attachment macro on here, I can now manage my attachments directly in the main page itself. I can view the attachments, I can change the labels, I can see if there's versions, and I can manage those versions directly right here. Also, there's another similar macro that's really nice, and it's called the space attachment macro. And what this, this looks very similar to the one above it, but what the space attachment macro does is it brings me every attachment across the entire space. Up above it, it's just the attachments on this page. Down here, it's the attachments across the entire space. And again, this is just a macro. By the way, macros are super easy to use in Confluence. It's just a space attachment macro, that's all it is. And I can actually, again, add space attachment macro after space attachment macro after space attachment macro. And I can just line up everybody's attachments across every space in Confluence. If I'm interested in five different spaces, I can collaborate all of those attachments into one page as five different space attachment macros. Really nice tool there. We get into that a lot more in our class as well, uh, but I'm gonna keep moving on to make sure we get a chance to cover everything. Templates are a very powerful tool in, in, uh, in Confluence. Um, templates are basically a page that has been saved as a template so that it is a standard form for people to collect information. Here's an example, um, project requirements. So this is an out-of-the-box template that you can acquire, and it's just a project requirement template. It's got a, um, a table up here that's got key information on the document. It's got goals, background, assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. But the key point here is that every time somebody's collecting project requirements, they are collecting the same data. This really solves two uh, problems with efficiency. One is that everybody is building on the same set of data. In other words, if I have a project requirement document, I know what I'm going to find in that document because everybody's using the same template. The second thing is it actually saves time. If I know what a project requirement template looks like and I'm interested in seeing questions on that project, I know before I even click into this document that once I get in the document, the questions are going to be down at the bottom because that's where they are in the template. And so every project requirement document that's created is mapped directly to this. And because this is a template, there's other powerful things that we can do with this, uh, uh, which I'm going to show you at the, end of the, at the end of the demo. So that's an example of a template. Here's another one. This is a how-to article. Basically, this is just a simple template on how-to article. Uh, again, out-of-the-box template. But as a user in a space, you can go in and you can manage your templates. I'm going to show you this real quick. Here we go. Here are all the templates that exist out of the box. There's all kinds of different templates, but you can actually go and create your own templates. And to create a template, all you do is create a page, put into that page whatever you want, a table, a bulleted list, uh, some, you can put these special uh, uh, phrases in there that say, click into here to type in this information so that people know what to do when they're filling in the template. And then you just save the template and now you've got your own, your own template. Really easy to do. We get into building out templates in our class as well. Okay, so those are templates, and uh, that's all I want to talk about templates right now. I just want to kind of introduce those to you. Okay, now I'm going to give you guys some uh, quick ideas around different things that you can do in Confluence. Um, now, let me just go, where is my page? Here we go. I'm going to give you guys a couple of quick examples of people that have built Confluence pages. So this is one called Escalate Product uh, or Excellate Product Documentation. This is just a simple, a simple themed documentation space. Um, all of these are actually public. You could actually go to these URLs and find them yourself. And so somebody has used Confluence to just basically uh, build out a page with information on it. Notice they've got a search bar here. That's a macro. They've got links to other pages. Those are linking features. Notice their, um, their hierarchy over here on the left-hand side. And then they've got a, a nice theme up on top. Here's another example. This is an example of embedding Confluence into a page. So this person has got a website and basically what they have done is they've embedded Confluence into that website as a page, as an embedded macro in the page. Uh, there are several add-ons in the marketplace to, uh, you know, dress up your Confluence pages. Here's an example of one using the add-on Refined Wiki. 
So they've actually created a dashboard in Confluence. And if you were to click on any one of these, what you would see is that that takes you into a Confluence page. And of course, here's your hierarchy here. They have some other features here that are basically giving you shortcuts to the other pages that are out there. Okay, that's using an add-on called Refine Wiki. And there's another great example. This is uh, one using the Bricket theme. And this is actually a college. And this is a public, um, uh, basically a public admissions office that has information on the academic policies and other policies. Uh, it's got links to admission and stuff like that. And this is a real college, Fort Lewis College. Just, if you went to their website, you'd probably land on this page. Uh, and it's just uh, information buried on a Confluence page. Uh, using Bricket theme. So those are some really great examples of how once you build out your data in Confluence, how you can visualize that data uh, in a public way. All right, let's talk about Jira linking. That's a lot of fun. So a lot of people use Jira and Confluence together. And so there are a number of different ways that you can connect Jira and Confluence. Um, I've just given you three examples here. This first example is just a JIRA issue ticket. So this is a Confluence page. And on that Confluence page, I have called to reference one ticket that exists in a JIRA project. I can go over here and look at this ticket. And I'll come back to it in a second. It seems to be having difficulty coming up. Um, and then underneath that, I have another example. This is a JIRA filter. So a JIRA filter is going to be a collection of JIRA issues or tickets that you're working on. And so this is bringing all of those issues onto a Confluence page so that people can reference them from a report or something like that. Now, the nice thing about this is you can actually edit this. This is a filter. It's bringing the filter to Confluence the way the filter is built. But if I edit this page, I can actually go into this filter and I can change the display options that I want to see. I can change the different fields that I want to bring in. I can change how many are coming in and a number of other things as well. So it's customizable. Let's go back here. This is the ticket that I was referencing on that Confluence page. Notice also, because I'm referencing it on the Confluence page, the ticket has now picked up a link back to Confluence to say, hey, this ticket's being referenced on the JIRA linking page. A third way of linking to, uh, to JIRA is through the gadgets. If, you're, if you use JIRA at all, you're familiar with dashboards and gadgets. This is a gadget being called the light on the, dish, on, the, uh, on the Confluence page. This particular one is going to be a filter. In fact, I believe it is this filter right here shown in the form of a pie chart. Uh, what I'm looking at here are different issue types in a governance project. I've got a nomination issue type, a purchase issue type, a user project request issue type, and several others. And I've got that just pie charted out. And so a user can see that as well. These are great tools for building out like project reports and things like that. If you're using JIRA for any work, you can reference that back onto Confluence. JIRA and Confluence also have a, a lot of linking around connecting, um, having one-to-one -one relationships between JIRA projects and Confluence spaces. So when you build a JIRA project, you have a Confluence space for tracking all the documentation in that project. Uh, when we think about JIRA and Confluence, again, another strategic idea, JIRA is where we track and manage and look at things we are doing, right? Confluence is where we track and manage and look at things that we are content related or things we need to know. And so that tends to be a good delineating line between JIRA and Confluence. Obviously, there's some things, there's some content or data in JIRA, like in fields or description or things like that. But if you have a really lengthy piece of information in JIRA, oftentimes it's best instead to track that in JIRA to put it in Confluence and link it back to JIRA. That way you preserve that information after the JIRA ticket is closed. Because if it is that much information, it's very likely you might want to use that information again in the future, maybe for another JIRA ticket or something like that. Um, although JIRA or Confluence actually has some work items too. For instance, JIRA is where we get work done, but Confluence has tasks. So what's the difference between a task and a JIRA issue, right? I, I like to say a task in Confluence is a very quick action item that one person is going to do. It's probably not going to take them very long to do. But if your task in Confluence winds up taking too long, like I showed you earlier, you can just highlight that task in Confluence and create a direct ticket in JIRA off of that task in Confluence. And now the task in Confluence is an issue in JIRA as well. Okay, lots of great collaboration. There's reports that you can pull in between Confluence and JIRA. And then the last thing I wanna mention here is if, you've, if you're using JIRA Service Desk or what is now called JIRA Service Management, 
um, Confluence and Jira Service Management work together brilliantly on knowledge-based articles for customers. A customer is going to your portal, creating a, um, a service desk ticket um, based on the words that they're putting into that ticket. Conf uh, Jira Service Management automatically recognizes that and populates a Confluence help article for the person submitting the ticket. That might help avoid the ticket creation or even solve the ticket creation. Lots of great collaborative stuff that happens there. You can, um, you can target Confluence pages for certain types of requests based on labels and things like that. So lots of really good stuff you can do there. All right, let's keep going. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about some macros that exist in Confluence. Now, when you think of the word macro, uh, sometimes people think of that word as a development tool, and it's a little bit of a scary word if you're not a developer. Macro in Confluence really is not a developer tool. It's like a little gadget that you can bring into a Confluence page that does something. They're very easy to set up. For instance, all three of these guys that I showed you right here are macros, and it took me about five seconds to set, set them all up. So I'm going to show you a couple of other quick macros that really help uh, Confluence pop as a content reporting uh, or content uh, management tool. Uh, the first one is uh, one of my favorites, the page tree macro. Now, what a page tree macro is, is it's kind of like a table of contents for your space. It's going to bring to light on a Confluence page all the links of your space. For example, what you're seeing right here are all the links that are in this particular space right here. Okay, And so that's all on one page. However, what I've also done here is I have replicated this page tree macro six times. One, two, three four, five, six. I've broken it into three columns in a table. The left column is personal. The middle column is project and the right column is business. In this confluence space or in this confluence instance, I have many, many different types of spaces. And the last thing I want to do is constantly click around from one space to another to find the articles that I'm interested in keeping tabs on and reviewing. So I've built a table that will track all of it for me in one page. And I've broken that table out into personal spaces, project spaces and business spaces. The two on the left are personal spaces. This is my space. This is my coworker Elizabeth's space. In the middle, I have two projects. This is a Jira bootcamp project space, and this is a coffee project space. And I don't know what coffee is, but it is, it's a project that we have here in Confluence. And then on the right side, I've got some business spaces. So this kind of goes back to this diagram that I was talking about. Here's personal, Here's, um, here's uh, businesses and here's projects, right? That's exactly what I'm doing here. And so I actually have these called out on each of these, um, each of these areas in my table. So in one page, I have six spaces broken out into different space types and then broken out into every document on that space. There's a lot of other stuff you can do with page tree macros. Like you can bring in a page tree macro that only shows a portion of a space, like show me everything from Confluence webinar down. Don't just show me the entire thing. So I can actually bring back subsets of spaces as well. Lots of really cool stuff you can do with that. Okay, here's a couple of others. Um, some macro and widget examples. Here's a meeting notes log. This is going to be a log that is going to give me information on meeting notes as they come in. If I look at this, I'm going to notice all this is, is just a library. It's just a content report table, and it's a macro that's grabbing any label out there within a, a select search range that has the label of meeting notes on the page. And as soon as it, as soon as a page is created with the label meeting notes, it grabs it and dumps it in here. This is a basic meeting notes log. Now notice while this is also a, re a really useful log of information, the, the columns are, are standardized. We have a title, we have a creator, and we have modified. I'm going to show you next a page property and page properties report macro that does the same thing, only it allows you to customize your columns. Now we actually have some user errors going on here. So this is getting stretched out, but you can see that these are totally customized columns. This page is an Atlassian app summary. It's a library that we use here at Expium to help remind us and teach us about good apps that are out there in the marketplace 
and specific things that we have learned from using those apps with clients. So refine for Jira service desk, calendar sync, restricted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've got the title. I've got the Atlassian tool. I have the author who crafted the particular document. I've got what platforms it is, whether it's cloud or server or data center, number of customers that are out there. And every one of these is actually tied to a template, which means that when I click on it, I know exactly where to find what I'm looking for in the information on it. Also, I can add one directly from here. If I do that, that'll just create a new template for me. Now, oh, I'm going to close that because it's taking too long. But it's basically all organized and summarized for me. Again, this is there's no information on this page. If I hit edit, all I'm looking at is I'm looking at a tip macro that says, hey, don't just repeat a lot of information on these, on these documents. Add something that's valuable or personal. I've got the create from template macro, and I've got the page properties report macro. Just three simple macros, and I instantly have a huge amount of content portal visualization power. So that's another example. Go back. I lost my thing. There we go. Um, this is a page with a Google example. Uh, so you can bring a Google widget in. Now, what I'm showing you here is the exact same Google GDoc page four different ways. It's displayed as a link. It's displayed as a URL. It's displayed as a card or it's displayed as an embedded document right in the page. Let's keep going. Uh, this is a YouTube video widget. So I, again, I'm, I'm showing it two different ways. I can either display it as a URL if I don't want to take up a lot of screen real estate, or I can embed the, um, the right directly in here. And so this, All right. there's going to be a, uh, uh, an, uh, this is actually another webinar we just did last week, an agile approach to HR that is on our YouTube page. Uh, by the way, shameless plug, if you didn't know it, we have a YouTube page with tons of videos out there. Uh, and if you want to learn more about things, you can go out there and check it out. So those are some of the um, different things that you can do with those, uh, with those macros. Okay, so when you think about Confluence, I want you to think about the idea of this is not just a documentation tool. Much of which I've shown, what I've shown you today is not documents at all. It is links, images, macros, pictures that are connecting to documents that live completely somewhere else in another world. It could be somewhere else on this instance. It could be somewhere else in a different instance of Confluence. It could be somewhere else like your SharePoint site or something like that, okay? That is really the power of Confluence. So to make Confluence really work for you, you have to do two things. You have to have holistic organization of the instance. You've got to get that done throughout your entire organization so everybody is, understands where things are. By the way, Confluence is a dynamic tool too. So if you've got an argument as to how something should be organized, it will play itself out over time, right? Whatever works better over time is the one that's going to win. So you just wind up dynamically changing it to whichever one works best. Um, you could even run both of them at the same time. Set up, you've got an argument as to how to manage information, set up two spaces, build them both out the way different people think they should be built out. Then over time, figure out which one is used the most and then just get rid of the other one, right? So holistic organization of your content across your uh, company, right? Across your corporation, including how these spaces should be built, what spaces you need. That's the most important thing. Secondly, after that is once you figured that out, determine what part should be content and what part should be visible so that you can really capitalize uh, on, the, um, on the concept of Confluence being a, a full content portal and not just a documentation tool. Okay, um, I ran through this really fast. There's a lot of stuff out there in the uh, Confluence. We just scratched the surface. Like I said, we spend a whole day getting into this, getting you into the tool, doing um, workshops and things like that. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, come check it out. If you actually want us to come to a private class for you, we can do that as well. If you actually want us to uh, just do some consulting on Confluence for you, we can help you out with that as well. Um, and so just let us know any of that. I'm going to take you right back to uh, my slides here at the very end. And I'm going to show you uh, this last slide, which once again has my uh, email address on it. And it also has a QR code, which if you kind of put your phone up to the screen and your phone picks it up, it'll take you to all of our upcoming events uh, that are going to be happening in 2021. So that is my webinar for the day. I am going to ask if there are any questions before we wrap up the webinar.
All right. Well, thank you folks for coming. Um, I appreciate your, uh, your listening for the last hour. I hope this was useful to you. And uh, if you have any other questions, reach out. Otherwise, we will see you out there in the Atlassian ecosystem. Thanks.